So here we are on another episode of Financial Futures, uh, the series with uh, with Carl. And um, it's been a, it, it's been a few weeks, Carl. Uh, how have yeah. you been? Well, not so bad. Yeah. So last time we jumped into some cryptocurrency, and uh, I, I, I returned to the book, and I, I have to say that I'm so act- I'm really really impressed with the organization of the book. Um, I went through the index, and um, I'm kind of like a an index uh, affection auto, right? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> well, as a book lover, right? I I, I look to an index, and I, I say, wow. I mean, uh, do you remember the decision making process that you and your publisher went to to um, you know to go with a subject and in a people index? Like that's uh, that that that's quite the that's, that, that's, that was something suggested by um, the the, uh, the book editor, and um, she 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 had a service that would do it, and I was surprised at how quickly they could do it and how completely. I I was trying to imagine how you would do it uh, manually, and yeah. it's pretty tough. But uh, apparently, there are tools and people who know how to use them that. Um, can do it remarkably quickly. Well, that's really interesting. I yeah, I find that really interesting. So you have an index by name and an index by subject. And what is um, uh, you know kind of interesting if you start you know kind of just dancing around the index by subject, you're going to see things like on page forty nine, not even leaving uh, the section of A, um, Animal Farm, for example, and. You know this. This is really interesting, and I and I think that um, I know how I like to read a book. It's not always from A to B. You know, I'll find something interesting in the index, and then zoom to that portion of the book, and then try and find out, you know, what what you're correlating, you know, to here in in terms of, uh, you know, Orwell's book. Do you recall what what you had mentioned? I guess it was just before chapter two about about Animal Farm. Yeah. Yeah, I do. But before I tell you, there's um, what you're describing. I, I actually had an image created. For, well, you can't see it here, but it, but it, but it's on page ten, um, and and it basically lays out the five sections of the book, and has a a meandering river image, oh. and and the idea is that okay after uh, you know reading two or three of a, a Early chapters, they kind of give you the the foundation. Yeah, this is like meandering around because the whole idea, the the, the mega idea, was and this gets into how people learn um, that the best value I could provide was to illuminate connections for people that they had already observed, that they had noted nodes of, of of things about economics. Entrepreneurship, investing, um, political, social environment, and and simply light up a connection between those different nodes, so that like any system, I I, I think that one of the benefits that somebody has um, who studied something as a system, you know, it could be uh, in the sciences and medicine, philosophy. Um, accounting even um, is when when you start to round the bases, you you get an expectation as to cause and effect and relationships. And and if there's if you're learning something new, you you tend to anticipate connections. And if if you don't see it, you say, well, huh? How do you get? I I, I see A to C, but where's the B? Um, and Capital formation is just like that. It's, it, it's unfamiliar to a lot of people. It's complex, but it's not difficult. It's no more difficult than baking bread, you know, in, in a sense. Um, so appealing to that proclivity that people have to create connections between seemingly disparate uh, uh, things is really what I was trying to, to, to get at. And, and the point of that river uh, uh, visual is- What, page, what hey, page was that on there? Uh, page 10. Page 10, okay. 
Um, cause I, you know, you were so, so nice to send me, a. uh, you know, a printed version. And of course I bought a version of it on Google books as well. Um, now here's the thing is that page 10, I don't have the hard copy in front of me cause I'm, uh, traveling. Like you said, I uh, see it, the page that's up on the screen. It says 36. Oh, oh yeah. What is that? Um, so that's sec section one. So this would be in, um, the purpose in, in the introduction. But in the introduction, okay. you just had it. There you oh, go. yeah. So that that's the idea. It's, this is this is a meandering. Um, oh, okay. Journey. So so the the per, the overview section is about ten chapters in there. That's sort of the blocking and tackling and gives the background of of um, of how I came to write the book and, and some issues that came up. Um, the second section is the macroeconomic context for the model, which is really dealing with three subjects, three chapters. Economic growth is one. Income inequality is another. And then there's a potential for um, cooperation, the ability to cooperate to become a competitive tool. Um, Valuation has four chapters on it. Uh, there's a section on investor loss, uh, which is uh, really an interesting one. What causes it and why are regulators anxious about the idea that average investors could participate in um, venture capital investing? And then there's the advanced topics at the end, which is more discussion about risk, game theory, and then blockchain and initial yeah. fund offerings. So let me let me walk you through this meandering uh, metaphor and in this picture here. So I see it's very clear for me the fair share model overview, um, and then where it bifurcates here is the difference between it's between context for the fair share model and then valuation. Um, it's interesting to me that valuation ends in a in, in, in a dead end dendrite there. In, in a, <laughs> well, it kind of loops back into the context, I guess. But but okay, that, that wasn't too too purposeful in in how the lines were drawn. Okay, um, but yeah, I, I, I here's, here's if you were to bounce between the macroeconomic context and valuation, I'd, I'd raise a couple of points. First of okay. all, no one knows how to do it reliably, um, but. Uh, it's as difficult as being put in front of a class of elementary school kids and being asked to rank the kids based on who's going to be happiest in life. You're going to have clues, but you're going to be wrong in, in a lot of respects. Um, but and one of the things that people have has been illuminating a lot of political discussion over the last few decades has been the idea of is the economy rigged, um, rigged against average people? And as I just, you know, talk about valuation and the idea that no one knows how to do this properly or reliably, it's the idea that, it, you know, this is, economies are very complex and big thing. Uh, I think it's an overstatement to say it's rigged, but it's tilted. It's tilted against the interest of the average investors in the public market. It's tilted toward those who can basically set themselves up to do arbitrage between the private capital, uh, private market valuations and public market valuations. Um, you know, the, the, the basic issue in the book is why if you looked at a trend line of, of companies, their valuation as they approach the public market, why do they go up as dramatically as they do? Is it because they're performing better or is it because of something else? And 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 so one of the chapters in, in the overview kind of discusses the problems with a conventional capital structure. Um, and, and it leaves, there's, there's two thought experiments I, I, I leave 
uh, a reader with in those chat in that chapter. One is, can you think of a reason why a new investor in a company would prefer a conventional model as opposed to the, which has no price protection at all? Uh, a modified conventional capital structure does. This is what VC and private equity investors get. Mm. And the other, the other thought experiment is, uh, you know, imagine uh, who's the best customer of uh, the investment bank. Rather, it's done by lottery. So there's a randomness, and and the only way that the well-heeled, well-connected investors can get shares in in a newly public company is to buy them in the secondary market from other investors who have won the lottery. Question is, how long would it take for those well-heeled investors to say, we need a better way to do this, a better way to value these companies? Uh, They don't say that now because they're the beneficiary of this controlled distribution, the the way things are done, which is tilted toward the interest of the well-heeled and away from uh, the average investors. Yeah, so one of the, one of the good things, I think, um, beyond the ethical claim that you're inherently making with that statement is, is the fact that it actually opens up the investor pool to a, a much, much bigger pool. Yeah, and it, it really it, 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 it's a philosophical discussion about markets. If you really believe in markets, you want it to be open. You want competition. Um, so could I say, could I do, if we do a follow-up book, could we call it from cest to best in terms of pools? Cest to best? Yeah. What's cest mean? Well, from cest pool to best pool. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's, that's catchy. Yeah, that's catchy, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. you, could, you could be a, you could be a headline writer for for the New York Post or something. Well, that's what we've got to do here, Carl's. We got to make your cool stuff really exciting because you've got some good substance. And I, and again, I just returned to the book, and there's a lot of really cool things, and you put some serious thought. You can tell by the depth of your uh, of your response that this isn't something that you just kind of whip together for a self help sort of you know to quickly sell a lot of books. There's some passion in here. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, and 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 I don't know all the answers, but I know I know that taking a page from the VC playbook, the thing that has helped uh, VC firms and private equity firms succeed in a space where there's a lot of failure risk. The, yeah, the, the these the playbooks are designed to. Minimize valuation risk, and and it's really worked well for them. Um, so, you know the the, the potential, uh, the Prometheus uh, Promethean idea is to to say let's take that idea and apply it to the public market. Mm. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we don't you don't get straddled to a rock and have your liver pecked. Right, yeah. It didn't turn out too well for Prometheus. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take you. You know, you can have your books on fire on the you know the you know the top any top ten list. Let's get it going, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it is an infectious idea. Uh, it just, it, it, but so that's the, that's that's the marketing issue, the exposure. Exposure, exposure. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because I think we should come up with some ideas and I don't mind putting it on our show, um, you know, because we've been kind of banging our heads a, a little bit on this to say, how do we get the, you know, you know the views of your show up? So um, I, I've, um, I'm actively thinking that we should be getting um, uh, some people from the financial space in, uh, you know, to talk about a section of your book. Um, you know, we may not captivate them to talk about the entire portion of your book, but to bring them on as experts and for us to have a healthy, you know, three-way conversation, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that would be a, a really good next step. Does that grab you as something that would? Yeah. Work? Yeah. I, I, I always enjoy that. The big question is how do you get a broader audience to pay attention to that type of what eclectic discussion, perhaps? Well, 
And here's the thing is that, you know, I, I did approach a few people in the RBC security space um, and on the investment side, I knew a few people and they're heavily regulated. So if they, um, if, if they decide to come into any sort of public forum to talk about anything, um, you know, they, they have to be very careful and <laughs> like there's, there's just a risk for showing up and having a conversation, you know, um, uh, you know, well, like I would think they could discuss how valuation works now. Um, exactly. Yeah. But if we want to, if we want to pin them down at all, you know what I mean? And say, well, how about this? Then it ends up into the, you know, the I hockey talk. A lot of them, a lot of people, I, I have, I haven't encountered uh, anyone that is a, is thoughtful about the space and also uh, declarative that, oh, it, there's no way to to, to innovate um, and, and and do something better. Yeah. Um, you know the the the, uh, the former chairman of Silicon Valley Bank in his re review said uh, um, the larger context, the Fisher model is an important work. The larger context is even more important. Reimagining the funding process from cradle to grave, as all the existing ones have serious flaws. Yeah. So that's, here's the guy that led an institution that made its bones based on, you know, participating in getting warrants, uh, options, if you will, um, in addition to interest when they lent money to a, uh, a venture stage company, a risky, a risky loan, and then taking those warrants, which are options again, um, and being able to sell them to somebody else. And it's, it's sort of like getting a little lottery ticket that you can, you can sell. A bank, that bank and lots of others that are, have, have followed uh, in their footsteps uh, can make, make a much better return than they can just charging interest. Mm. That that that's why they've done so well. It's not that they're charging more interest, and arguably they're suffering more exposure to bad loans. Um, but they've done better financially than traditional banks because they get this little sugar cube, uh, you know, the, the right to to buy uh, a company stock at today's price for like 10 years. And, you know, even if 30% uh, of them go on to have some success, 70% uh, fail, the, the, the rise in price, the, va the rise in valuation is more than enough to offset not only the losses, but provide a nice profit. Oh, I see. Yeah, and and am I correct in saying that this is short-term uh, valuation as well, right? Because it's incremental in terms of um, in terms of the risk. Well, it's short-term in the sense that it a decision being made at a, a point today, right? Yeah, and then and then subsequent oh. valuations. Oh. Um, interject themselves as the as as the project unfolds um it yeah it, it, it it's taking that crystal ball and polishing it or taking out that telescope and focusing it it's whatever the the analogy is again go you're in front of that class of elementary school kids and you're going to rank them based on who's going to be happy you're going to have clues looking at these kids. But how often are you going to be wrong? Mm. Because you just don't know. And, and, and so it's a short-term ranking, but it's, it's based on your, your uh, one's flawed um, uh, ability to, to see the future. And I, and I think that's especially salient as we move into a new era of economics that's going to be even more uncertain. Um, and I'm referring more to the pressures in and around um, uh, climate change, 
limits to growth. Have you heard of limits to growth? Oh, it's been around for, since the seventies, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but, but even before that, you know, there was a uh, Malthusian idea. Um, it was, it was, in, was it Robert Malthus? Um, yeah, Malthus, who, yeah. yeah. Who who hypothecated in what the eighteen hundreds, maybe? Yeah. That there was a, a limit on how much life the, the planet could sustain because we'd run out of food. You know, um, we'd consume things, but you know that that, that concept of um, It, it's sort of like driving at night, you know, with, with the, your ability to see beyond the headlights <laughs> isn't isn't there. And and there are things that happen. There is innovation in um, in technology, uh, innovation in in ideas um, that that can extend the light, if you will, um, and ma make the road seem more um, palpable. Um, so that 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 was the, the basic difference between a conventional model and a fair share model is comes down to one word timing. And the question is, when do investors pay for future performance? Do they pay up front? That's what they do in a conventional uh, structure using you know as a result of their crystal balling and saying i think this is going to be worth so much and then they discount it and say okay this is what it's worth today or do you pay um when the performance actually happens that, that's the fundamental choice you're getting there's no free lunch investors are going to pay for performance but do they pay in anticipation of it um or do they pay when it's delivered so with the fair share model you have this agreement on how to reward actual performance, but there's a there's a sort of a separation between the IPO investors, the ones who write the check to the company, and the secondary market investors who write checks to other investors, other shareholders. Um, fair share model positions the company to offer the IPO investor a, a really good deal. It says you're not going to pay for future performance at all. Um, you're going to, but you're buying into this contract, a smart contract in blockchain speak, that how we're going to reward it. And the secondary market investors do what they always do. They're, they're, they're crystal balling in and the like, and, and, um, um, you know, they're, they're going to be faced with a situation where they'll see comparable companies using a conventional capital structure valued much higher than one that has the IPO with a fair share model and the bet that's being made by a company that adopts the fair share model is that investors in the secondary market are going to bid up the price of the company saying hey this is an undervalued asset mm. as they do that some of the company's performance stock the voting non-tradable stock that the employees have is converting into the tradable voting stock that the investors got. That's diluting the percentage ownership of the investors, which you'd think they would not be happy about. But I say they're not going to care because the value of their position, the value of their slice of the pie is going up. Mm -hmm. There's a saying in the venture industry that applies, that captures this notion and it's, you know, VC will always say, I would rather own a small slice of a big pie than a big slice of a little pie. Yeah. Same, same concept. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how comfortable would you, I'm just as, as a side question, how comfortable would you be to explain this to um, uh, an economist? Would you oh, be able to oh, summarize? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They would. I, and I think they would love it because, um, yeah, it, it it's an intriguing it's an intriguing idea, and and you know, economists are philosophers trying to figure out what levers uh, and buttons, if pushed, 
will generate the greatest good. Right. And so what I'm, uh, I've actually, I meet with uh, economist Steve Keen. He's a post-Keynesian economist. I meet with him every Tuesday evening and uh, on our series called COVID and climate correlation. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think if they would be good to bring you on the show and, and uh, you know, explain your model a little bit, but um, I'd have to get you to brush up on your, on your COVID and uh, climate because <laughs> more than half of the show would be on that. And then, you know, I'd, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on, on two of these, on these two existential uh, risks that we yeah, face. Interesting. Yeah. COVID seems like it's, it's, it's um, a risk that one can't really tell how it's going to change. Is it, is it, is it you know, there's a trajectory certainly, but, you know, three, four, five years from now, we can't really say what's going to happen. Maybe inoculations, uh, vaccines would be uh, picked up and natural immunity might kick in, or maybe there's a new, c- continuing uh, new variants that are, are, are knocking people out. But climate seems more like you see this train coming at you <laughs> on a track, and you, you can see it 10 miles away. <laughs> And it's coming. It's it, it, it a existential calamity that is going to just ripple through the economy uh, uh, in, in profound ways. So, I mean, let's let's do a little daydreaming here and think that if you're um, if, if the fair share model got adopted in a big way with a new climate reality, um, uh, do you see, do you see that as being, I, I mean, here, here's, I'm, I'm going to put out my, my kind of thought is I, I would say that your model would actually work better because of its short sightedness. And I don't use that in a derogatory way. I do it in the fact that it's more agile. I think that your system and the fair share model seems to be more agile. Um, like one way for you to look at it is to say that it, it it's a, a, a better and a more efficient way for value uh, uh, for valuation, which I agree with, but it also makes it more agile as it approaches uncertainty. Um, would you agree with that? that was, that was an interesting thought. Um, I think the big issue is it allows for a reward for certain performance that isn't really doesn't figure in clearly into a conventional model. It's a, it's a whole idea of impact investing, uh, where it's, there's something more important than the financial return. And, and that's been driving the impact movement, uh, sort of the social good uh, type of thing, which is a, an appeal for why investors should want to support something. They, they, they um, so the question becomes, all right, does the reward, the reward being conversion of the performance stock into the tradable stock, is what the economic value? Normally, if, 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 if something has some economic value and you've got the dilution of, of the tradable stock because there's more of it that's converting from the non-tradable stock, that, that percentage dilution. You know, you, you own 30% of the company before, now you own 25, uh, you, you own 30% of the tradable stock before, now you own 25%. You've suffered 5%, you've, you, you, you've been diluted. But if that Dilution was triggered because of some performance measure that has economic value. That pie got bigger, so you didn't. You, you may have suffered percentage dilution. Yeah, you own less of the company, tradable stock, but the value of your position has gone up because that w- was worth something. So what? What do markets? How will markets assess? value to things that are socially good is the question. Um, I suppose the obvious answer is if, if, 
it will be this search what Demosthenes say, or you know, looking for an honest man, um, um, look, looking for the economic value. If, if you have a company that could effectively clear, uh, re remove plastic from the oceans, people would say, oh, that's social good. But the reason the value would go up is that they could envision a lot more business. You know that uh, somehow they would be, you know, you know, cohorts of of, of uh, you know, countries that were involved in, a, in an ecosystem would come together and want to pay, or somebody would pay. So the value wouldn't flow so much from oh, this is a good thing, as much as. It's a good economic thing. So it's a check and a balance to the, the feel good stories. You know, it's like we've come up with this technology. OK, how do you scale it? Is it actually progressing? Is it doing the good that you, you uh, I guess, envisioned? And then what are the measurable results? And then how does it how does it grow? That, that's fascinating. Yeah, well, it, it, take, take a look at. Um, Clean water. Let's say uh, there was a company that um, could could provide systems that improved access to clean water in areas that didn't have it. Um, a good thing, undeniably. But would the stock of that company go up because they are capable of doing good things, or would it go up because oh, there are a lot of places that could you know attract financing to get this in and and they, they would be a big company and and you know maybe they'd make money. I, I don't know how to call that. So right now it's kind of like the system is agnostic to goodness, really, right? It doesn't matter whether it's good or yeah, it, it's 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 more of a, is it valuable or or um maybe better more to the point, because I'm thinking of crypto assets you know um there are things that go up in value value economic value without having great utility um so if you if if you know that other people are going to want it a lot more people are going to want it even if it's nonsense <laughs> um, um people will be attracted to it because it's an economic incentive um, it, which is different, can be different from the humanitarian, meritorious, uh, environmental, whatever more high minded um, assessments of value would be. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, anything else that you can say about? Climate. I mean, what are you doing in your own community, or how? What's what? Are, do you think about it very often? Oh yeah, yeah. I, and I, it's sort of lament every time I go to the recycling bin. You know, I, I think about okay, I see the green stuff that probably pre handled pretty well, but plastic. My goodness, I know that you know the the amount of plastic that can actually be salvaged and put to some use, that the percentage versus that can get repurposed as opposed to what gets put into a bin um, is not very good. And, and, you know, anytime you go out, if I go out to get something to eat, you know, and I'm, I'm saying take, take out or something, I, I know I'm thinking about this packaging and how long it's likely to, to be around. Um, yeah. And how the fact that there's some food residue on it is likely to render it unsuitable for a lot of recycling efforts. Um, it's sort of depressing. It is Look, depressing. I'm I'm 100 percent on board with you on that, and, and, and it's to the fact that um, well, I'll kind of explain it this way. Um, my wife and I, we, we approach it from the standpoint of definitely eating out less and less takeout. If we did have to do takeout, 
Um, and I'll come back to the concept of austerity in a minute because it's, it's a little bit about that and I think is really a significant part of the solution is an uh, uh, austerity play. But when it comes to going out, um, you know, say X number of times a year, you could say, well, we're going to not, we're going to like take that down by um, instead of a hundred times a year, we'll go out 10 times a year. Right. And then if you do go out and it ends up being like a takeout situation, then, um, you know, bring your own dishes if that's a possibility. Well, it got uh, more- as I was listening to you, that, that idea uh, came to mind. And I don't think I've heard anyone else suggest that, but that would make a lot of economic sense. Now, um, who would benefit from that? You could say maybe the restaurant because they're not um, – they're not having to pay for packaging. Um, maybe there'd be some concerns about non-standard packages and 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 handling and who's at risk, you know, if something breaks or something like that. But boy, that would be if if, if it was a movement for people to bring their own containers to restaurants, either for what they're not they're eating on site but not consuming. Or for takeout, you know, you, you, for takeout, you'd be slowing down the process a bit because when somebody arrives to pick up the food, isn't necessarily when the food is ready to be picked up, and and food production lines want some standardization you know, and be able, you know, make what's going on and put it to the side. You can see where um, interjecting the Uncertainty of the of the t- availability of a consumer provided container, its suitability, um, and when it gets there, as just creating inefficiencies. But yeah. boy, that that would be c- certainly if if it's food that initially consumed on premise, um, that would be a good good thing to do. Somebody, uh, it could be a little movement. I thought of that too. And, but you know, when all you, you've got all these different types of systems coming up, like different ways of doing things. And then there's umpteen numbers of manufacturers that will come up with personalized uh, takeout containers that are more permanent. And you've now spawned a whole new industry and there's still the takeout containers and there's all this other stuff. So it's like, you need to parse, you need to say, I don't know, maybe I'll take it to an extreme where it's like the government says, no, you get one takeout thing and you have to use it. You got to bring it. You can't order it unless you have X, Y, Z container and you can order it from, you know, you'll get it one when you submit your taxes. <laughs> That's more likely to happen in Canada than in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, you know, I'm actually really, um, I'm really, I'm going to say upset because it, it's emotionally barbarous to me. Uh, this, this, um, this, uh, I guess, this narrative or this um, this conversation that's going on with the United States that says, um, "I'm not going to do the vaccines because it's, uh, you, you know, it's 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 against freedom and, all, yeah, yeah. freedoms and all this sort of stuff." And and then right behind that, it's like, "Oh, and watch!" They'll say the climate scientists will say, "Oh, we get a few extra degrees or more forest fires this year, and you know, pretty soon we're going to be telling you how to run your business." And you know, if if I sit down and I talk to these people, which I have, um, they they'll take this to a civil war. They 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 will not they will not give up what they feel entitled to. I mean, you take the idea of like the American, you know, like guns and stuff, right? Same same thing. You know, I I think. Um... You can see the the two, the two fields of thought or uh, emotion. I find it difficult to talk. Um, you know, on, on from from the non right uh, uh, perspective, it it these positions uh, signal a lack of understanding, a lack of. Uh, compassion or interest in anyone's interest other than one's immediate gratification. Um, on the other side, 
they're going to say, well, this is going to be um, giving more decision-making power to centralized authorities who traditionally haven't done a very good job of, of doing things just because it's centralized. You know, it, 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 you know, one of the fascinating things about uh, history is, is the, um, the difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Hmm. Both occurred pretty much, you know, around the same time. You know, the U.S. Revolution started maybe 15, 20 years before the French, but, you know, its initial constitution uh, or framework, the Articles of Confederation, didn't work out. It, it was confounding. And, and, and so they had to go back to the drawing boards and, and figure out, well, what's a better way to um, have a more perfect union as, as, as the U.S. Constitution opens up? And around that time, around 1892 or so, the French Revolution, Place and it has all all these good you know, uh, equality, uh, liberty, justice uh, as themes. Yet it goes off the rails in terms of being a top-down persecution-oriented uh, uh, system that, in many ways, uh, presages the Russian Revolution. You know where you know it's the only the interest of the state uh, whoever is is defining the state as political power um so the same germ of of um ambition which is to go from a feudal type of rule one where it's based on you know uh, uh family name or something like that to something that is democratic or fueled by the people had very different um, trajectories. And yeah, you can see the point of both. Um, and I guess the one thing, I, I, there is actually at one point in the book, I'm talking about these things and I just say that ism, ism based discussions, socialism, communism, capitalism um, type discussions, I find more often generate heat than light uh, because they're, they're sophomoric in many ways. You know, it's, oh, well, this is how it should be, but, but, but they don't really reflect approaches to life's real problems and possible ways to solve them. Yeah, very well said. I, I'm I'm very much against the French Revolution. I think it was such a disaster, and I, uh, you know, the the Rousseauian approach didn't end well. And uh, I don't want to have that happen to our precious liberal democracies. Um, uh, you know, so so I have some sympathies there. I think on the summary of 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 the right being ill, Ill informed. Um, I think we could go and give them a little bit more, uh, if I'm being a little bit more empathetic, I would say that there is something fundamental that says, um, I've got to make money or my kids don't eat, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's difficult for an average middle-class family to make money and, and make ends meet. And if, um, and if, uh, you know, we put more and more restrictions on people, then, um, you know, the middle class is going to feel the pinch and they're not going to like that. And I think it goes beyond just, I don't like it. It means, you know, there's a big problem with that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, um, and, and, and the, the coronavirus is kind of, Putting salt in the wounds, if you will, because um, uh, you can't ignore it and 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 be mindful of you know what what's really going on. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to 
cause a collapse uh, or, uh, or great economic harm, which fall differently on different people. Um, you know, somebody who, who has to commute on mass transit or work, work with lots of people doesn't have the same options as somebody who can work, work remotely can do on a computer. Um, so um, just trying to, in good faith, figure out what you can do with, and, and, and to, to mitigate the most, most of the harm uh, as fast and inexpensively as possible, recognizing if we can get past the, this hump, um, better days away. But, but you know, this is such an easy subject to demagogue, you know, whether you're a politician or a media person, um, because ultimately people uh, warm more to simple conf statements of conflict as opposed to, you know, deliberative thought. Well said, well said, yeah. And uh, I think that's where fan base starts to galvanize. And here you and I are putting a well-deliberated thought together and, and uh, you know, the, the, the swell of following and, um, and buy-in is, is uh, you know, we're paddling upstream. Maybe we should be more, um, you know, pander to the, you know, to the narratives of, <laughs> that, you know, that we're just talking about. I don't know. I mean, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> Carl, I can't do it. <laughs> the, uh... I was saying, like, we, we, we have to put it forward in the way that, that we know is the best and uh, I think we'll get there. But uh, that was well said, Carl. Um, as always, you're a great guest and uh, we're gonna stay offline here just for a minute after we stop the recording and I got a few things to run through with you, okay? Do you have anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, well, uh, this, this discussion reminds me of when I had with a guy when I was writing a book, I was emphasizing valuation. And I, I opened with this anecdote to the sections of that's on valuation. I'll just read it to you. Someone with experience in crafting Hollywood movies, consumer advertising, and marketing messages for financial products advised me to forgo my emphasis on valuation. He warned, it's a snoozer, snoozer. People want to engage at an emotional level. Just tell them the fair share model will make them rich. Here's what he recommended that I do instead of writing about valuation. Make the benefits of the fair share model the focus. And he said, start with a story about a young couple who wants uh, financial security before they start a family. The husband has stock options, but his family, his company can't raise the money it needs unless it has an IPO. It can't have an IPO because it's too expensive. As a result, his options are worthless. Because his options are worthless, he and his wife can't afford to have a baby. No IPO, no baby. <laughs> then say the fair share model can change that. <laughs> well, yeah. so, man, he, did you make me laugh? <laughs> yeah, you got to keep those marketing guys out of it, eh? Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I know I fall into that same category, right? But uh, you know, I'm trying to do it in more the uh, organic way, and it, it's uh, anyway. Anyway, stay tuned. That's another episode, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. And until next week, uh, that's that's Carl and his fair share model. <laughs>